it? He won the opening day, but then How's Al Tuve doing? Is he? He had a home run last night. Okay. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, my sister's been after me. Where is the Q&A? I've been putting it off, to be honest, because the questions are getting more and more difficult to answer. Uh, I don't know what's happened out there, but the viewers are getting way too sophisticated. So uh, I'll do my best, but as always, you know, I, I can only say these are my, <laughs> it's my opinions. But anyway, a lot of really, really good questions, so it is a good time to answer them. And um, so we'll start off. We've seen progress in transplanting gene-modified pig kidneys to people. What about other organs? <laughs> really good question. Obviously, that's a big uh, issue. Right now, the, the limiting factor with all transplant organs is the availability of donor organs. And so if there could be a way to, to, uh, to improve that, that would be great. So there, uh, almost every transplant society has had a session now on xenotransplantation. It was taking organs from other animals, particularly the pig. The, the pig, this is, <laughs> in case you wonder what, this is a Bama pig. They're like mini pigs. They're, I, I don't know, a few hundred pounds, but they're not that big. And their organs are about the size of uh, human organs. So, uh, and there, there's a bunch of companies that are doing gene modification of these pigs. So this was one, there's been one, attempt at a liver xenotransplantation. It was in a terminally ill patient who agreed to, uh, to do this, his family agreed to do this. Uh, so they took a, this particular liver that, from a pig who had six gene modifications. Uh, three are the ones that are known to mediate hyperacute injection. Those were inactivated. Two of them are genes that are known to prolong xenograft survival and they were overexpressed in the pig. And one is uh, prevents clot formation. It was inserted into the pig genome. And for the period of study, which was 10 days, the liver did well. There was, uh, it produced bile, blood flow work. And when they did a histological analysis, uh, it looked like the porcine liver, the pig liver, had regenerated perfectly well with no signs of rejection. So uh, it's still under investigation, but it is a huge uh, potential opportunity Although there are obviously uh, some risks that uh, people are talking about, but it's, a, it's an interesting and potential transformative thing for the field of transplantation. Got this question again. Uh, if a person gets infected with bird flu in cow's milk, would, would available antivirals improve disease outcome? Uh, so this is a really interesting study. Um, they, took a, they took mice and used uh, the two most, the most, most common or, or FDA approved antivirals, Bloxavir and also Tamivir, which is Tamiflu, and looked to see in these, these mouse model of H5N1 infection, bird flu infection, how, you know, how they would do. And what they found was that uh, it wasn't all that effective. It very much depended on the route of infection. Remember, you can, the bird flu has been giving people conjunctivitis, they can get through the uh, eyes, maybe the nose or swallow through the mouth. Uh, so the oral route, uh, which would be like drinking infected milk, was the most difficult. That ended up uh, being very difficult to treat in the mouse model. The easiest one was if they were infected through the eye, uh, and uh, it was somewhat mixed if it was through uh, the nose and upper respiratory pathways. And I think the main point of this is We've been saying that uh, these two antivirals would probably be useful, but this is kind of makes you think, well, not that great. So in the mouse model, they were only about 50 to 60 percent effective. So it means that probably we'll have to do better at either developing new antivirals or uh, making sure we have vaccination available. <laughs> okay, these, these are really good questions. This one. Uh, you mentioned in a YouTube video that older people who certainly had measles, those children, are thought to have lifelong immunity. But doesn't such lifelong immunity depend on periodic encounters with the virus to rev up the immune system? Before measles was eliminated in this country, people did have periodic encounters with infected individuals, but that hasn't been happening for quite a while. Uh, as, as an analogy, I understand that one of the reasons for the extremely high prevalence of shingles in older adults is that due to the chickenpox vaccine, people no longer encounter chickenpox that um, to rev up, you know, their immune system or be like a booster. Uh, so, 
So the person goes on to say, uh, my question is, isn't the assumption of lifelong immunity from a measles infection now open to question? Well, you know, that's a really good question, and I, I, I wasn't really sure, so I asked our expert, Dr. Tony Piedra, uh, and what his, his point, he sort of, I think, agrees with the question, is that um, because there's two issues. Measles is so highly infectious that if there's any waning of immunity, you're likely to have a problem. So what he just said is that um, your immunity does wane over time, and it does show that breakthrough infections are more frequent in individuals that are aged 15 or an older who've been vaccinated twice. So there is some evidence that uh, with the presence of the outbreaks, there's some waning of, of uh, immunity. And I guess the easiest way to do it would be if you're concerned, you can check your uh, antibodies to measles. And you know, for those people who have who are concerned, they can get a booster. So similar question, another person said, isn't it probable that, uh, that lifelong immunity isn't true? And again, uh, Dr. Piedra's response was, we should really focus on making sure kids get vaccinated. That's the real benefit. But it, as, as many people have said, you know, should I get vaccinated? Older people said, I've been vaccinated. And I've been saying, if you've been vaccinated twice or, you know, you are likely to be protected, if anyone's really concerned, you can get your antibodies checked. So in most cases, it's protective. It's a good question. I'm planning a trip to France in July, flying out of Atlanta for an eight-hour flight to Paris. Already, I like that. Uh, do you advise that I wear a mask in flight? I'm still watching your videos, enjoying them. I just threw that in there to pat myself on the back. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so now, uh, so I think the most important thing is to be up to date on your vaccines. If you are up to date on your flu and your COVID vaccines, I think you're in good shape. Now, that said, my son, who's up to date on his vaccines, just took a, did a trip to Brazil and got COVID. So, uh, you know, what, what I, if you're concerned, what I would do is the places that you're most at risk are walking through airports and when you're boarding on an airplane, uh, once you're on the airplane uh, and you're all seated, the ventilation is so good uh, that unless someone's coughing next to you, I'd feel very comfortable taking my mask off. But, if, you know, if you want to wear one, I'd wear it through the airport while you're boarding. Once it takes off and you're in your seat, especially if you're in business class, <laughs> I think you'd be okay. All right. My husband and I are both 72 and had COVID for the first time in December of 2024. Prior to infection, we received the updated 2425 vaccine. Given our age, is a booster dose of the current vaccine recommended for April? Uh, you know, frankly, if you, you know, you've gotten the, you got infected just this past December, you're in pretty good shape because you got infected with the, the latest strains. So you should be fine. Uh, the risk is low for you, but if, you know, if you're traveling internationally, if you wanted to, uh, get a booster in June or, you know, what did you say you were going to travel? Uh, I think you're okay, you know. You're really, you've got the most, by being infected, you've been, you've been protected for the next six, seven, eight months. So I think you're pretty good up until the, the fall. And then, uh, you know, at that point, maybe a booster will be, uh, be uh, recommended. I'll be updating people through the summer, so we'll see. This is a good one. I tested positive for COVID and was surprised to find out that Paxlovid now costs fourteen hundred dollars for a five-day course. <laughs> That's the price of drugs in the country. Apparently, Medicare patients received the drug for free only through the end of 2024. My Part D only covered the cost through February 28th. I'm fully vaccinated, so I thought I might skip it, but because of underlying health conditions, I opted to get it. Any advice for you, for me, or others? Well, so first of all, the cost is very much dependent on your provider or your payer, your insurance company. Some, some companies are providing Paxlovid at under $100 if a certain deductible is met. If the deductible isn't met, then it's, it's going to be higher, but I would check with your insurance provider. If, if you were vaccinated, I would feel pretty comfortable that you're okay, you know. But if you're high risk, when you say really high risk, I would use it. So if you're you know low risk and you've been you know vaccinated, you should be okay. If you're high risk, heart failure, history of lung disease, you know I would I would use it no matter what the cost. 
I am pregnant and was vaccinated as a child for measles. Should I get a booster in order to protect my baby? It shouldn't be necessary. So uh, the main point is if you've been vaccinated during uh, the development of the child, uh, the antibodies from your blood protect your baby for the first six months of life. Um, it's, it's interesting uh, now that some of, the pe inter some of the people are recommending that if you're going to do international travel or you're going to have exposure, um, you know, by traveling, that it, after six months, you know, we usually we recommend 18 to 24 months as your first vaccination. What they're now re recommending, if you're going to be exposing, you know, by international travel at six months, probably get your baby vaccinated, and then it'll be at two year or 18 to 24 months, and then again when they're ready for school. So it ends up being a three vaccination trial. But I think it's uh, for the first six months of life, your baby should be. Um, Back, you should be a baby should be protected. If you're concerned, check your antibody level. Your your doctor can do that. If you have antibodies, your baby's going to have antibodies. But how many flu deaths have been recorded this season? So so far, the CDC has recorded 24,000 deaths, including 151 pediatric deaths. Uh, so that's a moderate, to moderate, to, you know, moderate flu season. Up to 50,000 is a pretty severe season. COVID has been almost has been more than that. So COVID has killed more people than influenza this year, even though it's not that much. It's not that around uh, as many people, but it's it's still a very se severe disease. Okay, are the recent measles cases in the Houston area? Well, there is a first case of measles reported in Fort Bend County. Um, this was originated through travel. It's not linked to the outbreak in West Te Texas. It was really linked to international travel. So that's, uh, that, and that's the way you get it. Okay, uh, Fort Bend County. All right, that's enough. These are, these are all great questions. I'm, I gotta say, you, you're, you're challenging my knowledge base. Uh, but I appreciate it. Anyway, uh, I wanna end today with three shout outs. First of all, uh, congratulations to Dr. Barbara Troutner, Professor of Health Services Research in Infectious Diseases, who is award the, awarded the Brigadier General Don Wagner Award for uh, work to protect veterans from harms of antibiotic overuse. I uh, also want to uh, say we're really excited about uh, the Midland Independent School District that has entered an agreement with Baylor College of Medicine and our Baylor Center for Educational Outreach to create a district-wide STEM plus M pathway to help prepare middle and high school students for future careers in health and biomedical fields. Uh, we're really excited to bring this program to West Texas and it's been great working with folks in Midland, so we're all very excited. And I've got a brand new uh, high school and middle school building. And finally, used to discipline, not want to commit any penalties here. Intercepted, Akina, you will not catch him. Dom Akina turns on the afterburners, and there is the exclamation point. What a second half performance from the men from the Lone Star State. Uh, for anyone who enjoys the rugby game, Saturday, April 19th is Baylor Medicine Night at the Sabercats. Members of the Baylor community can get uh, discounted tickets that night through uh, the Sabercats website. We love the Sabercats, and uh, I'll be showing you why. Anyway, have a wonderful weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week. Sabercats.